Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Let me just say, as we are celebrating our 22nd anniversary, that when, uh, when Chuck and Elaine and Bill and Jean and Ann and Linda and I started meeting together 22 years ago, we had no idea what the Lord was going to do. We didn't know where the Lord was going to take us, what would become of this uh, group of people. But what I, what I know I want to be, our, to be a memorial of, uh, of us, should the Lord tarry, when they look at, at this group called Friendship, First Community Church and then Grace Brethren Church, that they find that we were faithful. If nothing else, I'll be happy with that, that we were found faithful. So happy anniversary, all. We didn't know where God was taking us, but where he's taking us now is into the kingdom. And we, as we're studying the gospel of Matthew, the king and his kingdom. Our uh, section that we're going to look at this morning is Matthew 13, 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. We're going to take that section in the middle and we'll look at it next week. Matthew chapter 13 is an interesting chapter. It is primarily made up of a bunch of parables. And you'll see that in verses 1 through 9, there is a parable. And then there is a passage where it describes why Jesus used parables. And then in uh, 18 through 23, Jesus explains the parable he taught in 1 through 9. So that's why I've divided it up the way I have. There wasn't time to be able to do all three sections today. So I'm taking a section out and we'll see it next week. As we uh, review, probably we should have looked at at, uh, at uh, 10 through 17 this week, and then next week looked at the two together, but we'll, uh, we'll be fine. Sowing Seeds is the title I've given to this uh, section of, uh, of Matthew, and the first section is the parable of the sower. Last week we ended with Jesus in a house in Galilee surrounded by large crowds, when told that his mother and brothers were outside waiting to talk to, them, talk to him, Jesus responded that his focus was not on the temporal families of, uh, of this earth, but on the eternal families in the kingdom of God. So we pick up our study in chapter 13, verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd stood at the beach. These first two verses set the stage for us of what's going on. And Matthew reminds us of what we saw last week, that they were in a house and when Jesus left the house, he went to the beach. Whether he talked to mom and the brothers, we don't know. Matthew doesn't tell us. It's not important to the story. I suspect he probably stopped and had... Uh, had some time with them, but we don't know. We're not told what happened there. We're not told how long it took, but I suspect he did. He was a good son. Perhaps he exited the house and went to the lake shore and talked there with his mom and his, his brothers. But the crowd followed him. As happened all the time for him, the crowd followed him. And then the crowd got larger. And then it got larger. And you, I like to envision things, and I don't know if you do this in your mind, but I like to envision how these things look. And having been to the Sea of Galilee, uh, this probably was in Capernaum. We don't know for sure, but probably. Been to the seashore there, took a boat ride from, from Tiberias to Capernaum. And, you know, he's down by the beach, and the crowd gets fuller and fuller, and he's backing up, and he's backing up, and the heels are wet. Then the toes are wet. You know, he just keeps going further back, further back. And finally, he jumps into a boat. And he goes out 
a little ways, and they all stand there at the beach listening to him. He said, uh, he told them many things in parables, saying, a sower went out to sow. Matthew then transitions from the background scene of Jesus leaving the house, going to the beach. Matthew records that Jesus had many things to tell the people in parables. Chapter 13 alone has 10 parables within it. So to understand chapter 13, we're first going to have to understand what a parable is in Scripture. Here's a, here's a dictionary explanation of a parable from the homiletical handbook. A parable is a type of literature or oral literature in the general category of figures of comparison. It consists of a story that has elements of reality the hearer or reader may easily understand. Sometimes the story is quite simple and true to life. Other times parables may include a most surprising point in them. Sometimes takes place uh, that is certainly not a, something takes place that is certainly not impossible but is at least amazing. Still a parable is always understandable as far as the story is concerned. The elements of the story are easily recognizable as is the plot. So that's what a parable is. A parable is a relatable story which relates to a framework, to something that Jesus wants us to, to understand. Most of us are learners that require more than one sense to learn. Sometimes you have to learn by feeling, by hearing, by doing, by smelling, by touching, by, by saying. It's a relatable story which provides us a framework to illustrate a spiritual point. Jesus wasn't the only teacher to teach by parables, but he certainly was a master at it. We also find several parables in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. The end of verse 3 begins the parable. A sower went out to sow. Now, let me clue you in on a little secret here. International Harvester and Massey Ferguson weren't invented yet. Okay? So when he went out to sow... Some things had to be done by hand. This is what a sower would look like in the time of Jesus. You get a seed bag strapped on, and you walk out to the field, and you're just broadcasting it by hand. Have you ever done that? It's kind of cool. It's not that hard to do. It's hard to get right. It's hard to make it consistent. It's pictured in the drawing. A farmer would have a bag over his shoulder and would would dip into the bag and grab a handful of seeds and broadcast them out. It's important that we recognize what's happening in this picture. I, I, I provided a little cartoon picture for you because I want you to see a couple of things in your mind because it will play into the story later. Notice that he has one bag of seeds. They're all the same seeds. You dunk your hand into that. You don't know what you're getting, but you're getting those seeds and anything else that's in there, right? And he casts them out. And, and as, as we go through the parable, you'll see how that becomes important. As he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and birds came and devoured them. As the farmer went along, some of the seed that he broadcast fell on the path in the field. It would have been hard packed and not tilled up. There'd be no place for the seeds to get into the soil. They lay on top of the pathway ready to be grabbed by the birds. The birds are going behind them saying, hey, thanks for dinner. I mean, it's, there's no work to it. He's sowing bird seed and they're going out and getting it. No work at all. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil but when the sun rose they were scorched and since they had no root they withered away as the farmer broadcast seeds some of the seeds fell on the areas of the field where rocks and stones had worked their way to the surface of the soil if you've been to Israel you'll know why they stone people there's a bunch of rocks there it's not like our dirt that we our sand that we have here 
I mean, it's nothing but rocks. There's rocks everywhere. And the farmer would have to go through, and I know it's like this all over the place, that you have rocks that work their way. I don't know how this happens. I've never seen a rock move. But from one year to the next, we, when we had our garden up in Indiana, you know, I, I, I'm kind of thinking Linda probably didn't put rocks in there. But I'd be going there with the rototiller, and all of a sudden it hit a rock. I tilled it last year, and there was no rock. This year there's a rock. How does that happen? Well, it happens all the time. As the earth moves and so forth, rocks come to the surface. And the farmers would go through by hand, because remember, International Harvester and Massey Ferguson were not around yet. John Deere was just a dream. They would have to come and pick up these rocks and pitch them to the side, and, and there would become rows then, areas where rocks were built up as they, uh, as they did that, because there was a lot of work to carry rocks to the side, and they would do that over time. So they... Some of the seeds fell on the area where the rocks had not yet been gathered. They had little opportunity to take root. Not firmly they took root, but there was a little bit. You know, a little bit of soil, a lot of rock. That You know, you get the picture. So they needed proper nourishment from the soil. The sun came up. And the lack of nourishment left the plants withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and thorns grew up and choked them. Still others areas of the field were overgrown with thorns, as we've all discovered in our yards. Weeds grow faster than good plants. Just look at your lawn. Come over to my house, look at my lawn. I spent a lot of money to have guys come out and kill the weeds, and the weeds grow fast, faster than my grass. I typically don't have to mow the grass every week. I have to mow the weeds every week. That's just the way it works. Some seeds fell into a thorny area, and thorns took nourishment and left the seeds with little nourishment, so they were choked out. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced good, produced grain, some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirty. As a farmer was there broadcasting his seed out, some fell on the path, some fell on the rocks, some fell on the thorns, and others fell in good soil. Plowed, tilled field. A farmer going behind an ox with a, with a hoe and tilling up with a plow, tilling up the field. Prepared. That's what I think Jesus means here when he says good soil. It wasn't packed down like the path. It wasn't full of rocks. It wasn't full of thorns. It had been prepared for the seeds. One of my favorite books was written by Michael Catt, the administrative pastor at Sherwood Baptist Church. We're facing the giants and the other Kendrick Brothers uh, movies came from. The title of the book is Prepare for Rain. In the book, Catt reminds the church that we can know God will send rain, but we've got to prepare for it. It's really the story of Sherwood Baptist Church in Albany, Georgia, as the Kendrick brothers came and said, we want to make movies. We want to impact the world for Christ. And this Baptist church gets behind the process, and we've seen those movies, and we all like them. They, the first movie done with a borrowed camera and church personnel, and it has turned into a million-dollar process now. Michael Katz said, we need to prepare for the rain. What's a, who's a good farmer? A farmer that waits until the rain comes, knowing that God will, uh, will uh, that the rain is there. Is that when they go out and prepare the field? No, you prepare for the rain before the rain comes. So this farmer here, who has the good soil, had to go out with an ox or a cow or donkey or whatever and plow the field in preparation for sending the seed out. The rocks have been brought to the side. The thorns have been cut down. The soil has been tilled up. The result of the work to make the field ready and the broadcasting of the seed, the result of that was some of the seed grew. Some grew by a factor of 100, some grew by a factor of 60, 
and others grew of a factor of 30. So do you suppose that the seed bag that the farmer had had a 60 yield section, a 100 yield section, and a 30 yield section? No. He had one seed bag that had all the seed in it, and he threw it out on the ground that was prepared. Some fell on the path. Some fell on the rocks. Some fell on the thorny soil. And others fell on good soil, soil that had been prepared, and still it grew 160 or 30, all different. Same seed. Supposedly same soil, but different growth rates. Jesus finished the parable with he who has ears, let him hear. It's a very short but meaningful statement. Jesus has used this type of statement before. He's not speaking of audibly hearing. He's speaking of having the ability to understand the underlying message contained in the parable. He's speaking about having the ability to hear, to understand, to comprehend, to make sense of what's being said. He just spoke in a parable. And he said, some will hear and some won't. Some will understand, some won't. So I want to jump over the next section. We'll deal with that next week. And go on down in your Bibles to chapter 13, verse 18. As here we have the parable of the sower explained. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Let me begin by saying that Jesus doesn't always explain his parable. But his disciples had asked him, why are you speaking in parables? And so Jesus explains this one. Sometimes he uses parables and sometimes he doesn't. And we'll look at next week why that happens. Here Jesus does explain the parable. It begins with the first location that the seed farmer uh, seed landed on. It landed along the hard packed path and never had a chance of germinating and growing. It only was bird feed. Notice what the seed represents. It represents the word of the kingdom. Today we'd say the word of the kingdom represents the word of God. Think back to the parable that Jesus gave. What was the result of the broadcasting of the seed of the word of God? The result was there was a division of where it landed. Not a division of where it came from. A division of where it landed. Path. Rocks, thorns, good soil. I probably ought to go the other way so that everybody feels like they're in the good soil at some point. Path, rocks, thorns, good soil. Just, just to be culturally sensitive. The seed, all from the same seed bag, was all the same. The differences are where it landed. The seed, the word of God, that was heard by those represented by the hard-packed path was not received. It had no way to germinate. It had no way to take root. It was just eaten by the birds. The birds represent Satan and his effort to prevent people from responding to the gospel. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on, uh, arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Now we get into a little bit more difficult text to understand. I should point out that both the, in the parable and here in the explanation, Jesus gives more attention to this category than to the others. Two verses in each place to this category. In this case, some of the seed falls on soil that still had many rocks in it. The person represented by the rocky soil hears the word of God and responds emotionally. 
Jesus specifically says with joy. He points out that it's received with joy. Gives us an indication a person receiving the word of God here is receiving it with emotion. They are happy, joyful at the hearing of the word of God. I would call these people many, I would call these people many people who think they came to Christ through the emotional calls of large rallies. I don't want to disparage Billy Graham at all. Even he admitted before he died that many, many, many of the people that came forward at his rallies over the 40 or 50 years that he held them were not actually saved because they were responding in emotion. They were responding to, to an emotional high at the words being spoken without any roots in following Jesus the emotional follower turns away you've heard me speak out against the, pro the approach of many evangelists today that appeal to people to turn to Jesus and everything in their life will be just fine when they lose their job or they have a house fire or they're told to have cancer, cancer the emotion of following Jesus is gone since they have no roots but Jesus doesn't end there as for what was sown among the thorns that is the one who hears the word but cares the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful still another seed from the same bag of seeds still the word of God falls on other soil this time the seed falls on thorny soil, which represent people who hear the gospel and have some initial acceptance of it. Not emotional acceptance like we saw in the previous one, but what I would call intellectual acceptance. Notice that Jesus doesn't say that they trusted or had faith, just that they heard the word of God and at least did not reject it. They had some kind of initial, initial intellectual acceptance. But then the cares of the world came along. Notice the next phrase that Jesus uses. The deceitfulness of riches choked out the word. These are people that hear the word of God, but don't want to give up their worldly lifestyle. They still want to do what they want to do. They don't want to give up what the world has to offer. These would be people that want to have their insurance policy, but not a change of life or a change of direction. They still want to do everything that the world tells them will give them happiness. Their happiness is their focus. And when they're not happy, they turn away. Not opposed to the gospel, but not committed to following Jesus either more committed to their own personal enrichment and personal enjoyment. I think that what Jesus says here is often overlooked. The deceitfulness of riches chokes out the word. People are often deceived by the lure of wealth. All you have to do is watch one, of, one hour of primetime TV and you'll see the appeals of the vanity of people. The promise of wealth, the promise of health, just watch a commercial for insurance where they allude to, uh, allude to you receiving a new life when you sign with them. A new wardrobe. Lost weight. And all the appeals that many people focus on, all from signing with this insurance company. Of course, they do that tongue-in-cheek, but they do it knowing that it appeals to you. Who doesn't want to have more money and be skinnier? I mean, you're cuckoo if you don't. Right? So they're, they're, they're intellectually appealing to what drives many people. I also need to point out that Jesus clearly states that this seed was unfruitful. He's not talking about people saved. He's talking about not saved people. They're unfruitful. And he goes on in verse 23. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields. In one case, a hundredfold, in another, sixty, and in another, thirty. This fourth group of seeds falls on good soil. Soil that has been prepared and is ready for the seed to spread. 
a place where every preparation that needs to be made is made so the seed germinates and bears fruit. It's a reference to the person of the Holy Spirit, how he's prepared for the occasion when the Word of God intersects with them. Have you ever thought about the logistics that God goes through to bring you to him? He calls you before the, the founding of, before the creation of the earth. And then he orchestrates all the events from Adam and Eve on to you. All the events that have gone into your life so that at some point that he has designated, you are prepared. The thorns are taken out. The rocks are taken out. The, the soil is tilled and ready for the seed to land in you and germinate. He did all of that so that at that right time, you're ready to receive him. And oh, by the way, he then gives you the faith to believe. He did it all. He does all of that for all of us all the time. That's preparing the soil. That's good soil. Soil where the Holy Spirit has gone before and made you ready. Now that may be made you ready through something you heard on the radio or through a church service or through a friend talking to you or through your picking up a Bible someday and reading it and getting inquisitive. That's the Holy Spirit working in advance. God prepares the soil and then spreads the seed, and then he sends rain to make it grow. And Jesus tells us that this seed did indeed bear fruit, some yielding 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. I wish Jesus had a couple more verses here. I wish he had said, here's why some were 30, some were 60, some were 100. I wish I could understand that. But I don't. And he didn't. Same seed, same soil, some 30, some 60, some 100. Now, from an agricultural standpoint, I can tell you why. Sometimes it just doesn't, germinate well sometimes there's other things in the way same seed but something prevented it from growing as much so what do we do what do we do with jesus teaching by the parable of the sower we'll discuss next week lord willing the section we skipped over to keep the parable and the meaning of the parable together. We'll discuss next week why Jesus teaches with parable. As we look at this parable and Jesus' explanation of it, what is it that Jesus wanted his disciples to understand and for us to understand? I think there's some important principles here for us. Jesus was not, first of all, giving us hard and fast numerical guidelines. He was not saying that only one quarter of your evangelistic efforts will work. It's not what he's saying. He's not saying that only one or at least one. He's just giving a reference of different kinds of, of seed. Some evangelistic efforts are, are really, really good. Bear lots of fruit. Other evangelistic efforts may be just as sound, just as good, just as hard felt, and bear little fruit. So that's not what he's saying. He's not telling us that there are hard and fast, only one quarter of your efforts will ever succeed. All the same seed, so it's not the result of better, better preachers or evangelists or better witnessing on our part or on someone else's part, especially since we've all been uh, learning in our five sola classes that God gives us the faith to believe. It's not about what we do. We should understand here that the majority of people will not respond or become followers of Christ. That's just the way it is. The majority of the world is going to reject God and reject what God has said. That was true for Jesus. That was true for the apostles, and it's also true for us. Second, I think we see here that Satan is actively working to prevent people from becoming followers of Jesus. 
as I contemplate Satan and his efforts against Jesus, I'm a little mystified. He's created as the greatest being. He knows way more than we do. And yet he still believes he can win. He still believes he can thwart Jesus. And so he, in his hubris, he's actively working against God. I'm fascinated by the fact that he thinks he can thwart Jesus. That's hubris. But we need to know he's actively working against us. Third, I think we need to see here that God, God's word does, does have an effect on soil that's been properly prepared. When the Holy Spirit goes before your efforts, his word will have an effect. Now, there's a couple of things in that that you need to recognize. Your evangelistic efforts need to be in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. You need to be praying about who you can reach and how to reach them. You need to be praying about what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. You need to be praying that you will recognize that the field is ready to be planted. When the ground is turned over, when there are rows ready for the seed to go in, the seed will then germinate. Now the ground being turned over may be somebody else doing the work. Or maybe you're doing the ground turning for someone else. Maybe you're just preparing. I told you before about the guy, my mentor as a detective, worked for him for a number of years. Met him a couple of years ago uh, again at our uh, old timers reunion and I had witnessed to him I don't know how many times. I'd sat at his desk with a Bible and, and preached Jesus to him and taught Jesus to him I don't know how many times. And he didn't want anything to do with it. And years later after we were both retired he came to me at an old timers reunion and said that he had come to Jesus and it was my fault. I had laid the groundwork. I didn't know that that's what was happening. I thought it was a lost cause. But I had laid the groundwork. I was, I was plowing the field. I was getting the rocks out. I was taking the thorns out. So that he eventually came to Jesus. There are so many ways that the Holy Spirit works to prepare a person for a moment of faith. Maybe that's the job Jesus calls you to do is preparing people and somebody else has the privilege of leading them to the Lord. Fourth, we need to see that when soil is prepared, the seed bears fruit. Sometimes a lot of fruit. Sometimes only a little fruit. But it always bears fruit. Properly prepared soil, including the Word of God, means fruit. Fruit is not the reason for salvation. It's the result of salvation. People bear fruit because they're saved. Not because they bear fruit. They're not saved because they bear fruit. An apple tree doesn't give you apples, and so we call it an apple tree. I'm not saying that because the fruit of these people or because of the fruit, these people have become saved, I'm saying exactly the opposite. Because they have been saved, they have become followers of Jesus. They bear fruit. What the fruit looks like in the life of a believer, the life of a follower of Jesus, is a different story and a discussion for a different time. How you, what fruit you, you produce in your following of Jesus looks different for all of us. Billy Graham had a completely different fruit bowl than you do. But we're all to bear fruit of some way of whatever Jesus calls you to bear. The bottom line is the gospel will be rejected by a majority of people. But some will turn when they've been prepared by the Holy Spirit and they've been, fa been given faith to believe. They will then, as followers of Jesus themselves, bear fruit. Think about Jesus bearing fruit in the twelve. One goes away. Eleven. One's added, the twelve. And then Paul's added. 
And think of what came from them. Jesus, the 13, and then they ha plant churches who then plant churches who then talk to people who plant churches and, and it continues to multiply until we sit here today. 22 years serving Jesus. Think about all the work Jesus had to do to accomplish what he accomplished and how he used individuals to prepare. What did Paul say to the, to the Romans? Or I'm sorry, to the Corinthians. Apollos planted. I watered. God gave the increase. They all had different jobs. They all had different focuses. They all had different responsibilities. But ultimately, the word comes to fruition and God's word bears fruit. Next week, we plan on continuing from chapter 13, picking up on the passage we jumped over and discuss why Jesus used parables. You see, in this parable that we just went through, Jesus at first tells a, tells a story, and then he goes through and he gives us the interpretation of it. He doesn't always do that. And so we're left to figure it out ourselves. And here's the message Jesus wants us to remember. Excuse me, remember from this one. His word, the seed, lands all over the place. Many reject, but some come. And some come hundredfold, some come at thirtyfold, some come at sixtyfold. His fruit, his seed, his word, bears fruit when the field is properly prepared. Thank you, Father for allowing us to have a part in that. You could have done it so many different ways, but you chose to have us involved in, in, in that, and we thank you for that. We love you, and we trust that, that you find us faithful in following you and being obedient to you in bearing fruit that you give us to bear. You've, you told us that, that you have things planned for us to accomplish, works for us to do. Our, our desire, Father, is that we be found faithful in doing those, in being obedient to you and trusting you and following you and loving you. Thank you for 22 years of ministry here at Friendship. We trust that you would always be honored by that. We don't know what the future brings, but we know who holds the future. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.